schedule, so I don't know if we're going to do more than one. Um, so I guess we'll consider this our opening song. Over three seven three. Three seven three. again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. Amen. And that's that's our mission, isn't it? To seek the lost. You know, I, I, was, I was talking to some neighbors this week about uh, there's somebody that everybody was complaining about because uh, of the problems they caused, just harassing their neighbors and stuff. And I got to thinking about, you know, we run into these people who are just miserable, and we tend to want to react in kind, right? They're, they're being rude, so we want to, you know, I'll teach them. But we tend to forget people that are miserable, it's because... They need Jesus. They need Jesus. And sometimes we're miserable because we need Jesus too. Amen. And we need, as 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 I, it seems to me, and, and maybe it's just my perception, but maybe you feel the same way, it seems that the older I get, uh, just the meaner and crueler the world is. People are just rude to everybody. Um, there was an accident. Uh, down the street from my house the other day, a lady turned onto the street, and there's a huge ditch there by the railroad tracks, and she turned too sharp and actually rolled over upside down into the ditch. And luckily, everybody was okay. Her and her kids made it out of the car, and people were stopping to ask her if she was okay and if she needed help, and she was cursing them out and just yelling and screaming and just being really nasty to them. And it just seems like the world is just headed in that direction where there's so much more just hatred for each other. And the Bible tells us about that. The Bible says that uh, that love for one another will wax cold toward the end. And we just need to remember that it's, it's, it's the 
absence of Jesus Christ, um, that human beings were made to commune with Christ, and we can't be happy when we're not. And so when we run into these miserable souls, we need to remember what the source is and point the way toward Jesus if we can. Shall we bow our heads? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us safely through another week. We thank you for bringing us to another glorious Sabbath day that we can come together and share you and worship you and uh, praise you and thank you and that we can fellowship one with another and strengthen each other in your love and in your grace. We, we recognize that we are hopeless sinners without you, that we are miserable uh, and lost, and that the blood of your son Jesus Christ is the only hope that we have. And through you, we find peace and we find joy, and we thank you so much for that. We thank you for your love and your salvation. In Christ's name, amen. And at this time, we have a mission trip. fond memories of learning at this island school. I love teacher, teachers in this school because they, they, were teach, they teach me very kindly. The school's curriculum is based on the Bible. They only have three teachers, but what they lack in quantity, they make up for in quality of teaching. The school starts with prayer, then after that, uh, before they are going to classes, they start with the um, some story be by, related to Bible. So that they, after telling that, they will teach them one memory verse every day. This school has a positive reputation in the community. Every parent wants to see their child succeed, which is why Alex's parents trusted the Adventist school to educate her son. Unfortunately, the school only offers nursery and preschool levels for kids. The students have to look for other education options once they finish preschool. Last year, we had 32 students among those nine were graduated. That means they finished UKG, upper KG, then went to other school because we don't have the higher, higher studies. Then uh, primary school, we don't have. At his new school, Alex was required to attend class on the Sabbath. But thanks to his prior education, he was able to defend his faith to his teacher. I told to my teacher that uh, the fourth commandment is the we have to follow the Holy Sabbath. So I have to go to the Sabbath because I will obey to God. So I told to my teacher that if I don't listen to my Lord, then how to how is is it possible to listen to you? So I have to go to church. After discussions between the teacher and Alex's parents, Alex now has the Sabbath off. Alex is not alone in facing the challenge of attending school on Sabbath. Other Adventist students face the same problem. That's why this quarter we can help expand the Adventist school beyond preschool all the way through high school. Please pray for our church ministry in Andaman Nicobar Islands. All our church members pray for the an Adventist school in higher level, that is till up to high school, because all Adventist uh, children should continue their education here itself without any problem, without any difficulties. A portion of your 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will help build the new Seventh-day Adventist English School in Andaman and Nicobar Islands, providing a higher level of education so more people can learn about the love of Jesus. Thank you so much for supporting us through 13th Sabbath School Mission Offerings. Now time for our uh, lesson study classes, and there's going to be two classes today. Uh, Antigone Guevara will be teaching here in the sanctuary, and uh, Elder Damus, uh, David Freeman in the classroom.
morning, church family. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. I trust everyone had a good week, and if you didn't, you're in the right place. God is here with us, and he will bless us today. Questions. This is not a one-way street here, so please participate with me. Um, do you think worship is just something we do down here while we're on earth? So once we go to heaven and we're made perfect, immortal, we're still going to worship? Why? So it's not just because we're in a sinful state that we need to worship. He's our creator. Brother Steve, Ben, yes. Right behind you, Brother Ben. Thank you. I was listening to uh, one of the teachers on uh, YouTube, and he brought up something I'd never thought of that would maybe answer this. So does anyone know that verse, um, I believe it's in Isaiah, that says, from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship me. This is talking about in heaven, right? Um, so I know I didn't have that verse prepared to talk about today, but this just reminded me that Worship is not just something we do here on earth in our sinful state, but that when we're perfect and translated or resurrected in heaven, we're still going to have the Sabbath. We're still going to have this whole congregational worship experience, assembling together every Sabbath, every month. A new moon means monthly um, for these grand celebrations of who God is as our creator, redeemer, are all in all. So as we think about how we worship here, I love it how our dear sister talked about it's just practice for when we get to heaven because God deserves all of our glory and worship and adoration for eternity. Okay, will someone read Psalm 116? What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I love this question. And if you don't mind, I would love to hear what type of response this wells up in you when you hear the psalmist say, what 
what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Yeah, praise. Praise him and thank him. Thank him. Praise him and thank him. watch a show and be distracted from getting your cavity filled or your teeth cleaning or whatever you're doing. And you can pick from like a million different shows to watch. And so I decided to pick this one called I Shouldn't Be Alive. And first of all, I couldn't leave the dentist until I finished the episode because <laughs> that's how mesmerizing this thing was. But the point of this show is it's true stories of people who have gotten themselves into very life-threatening situations. Whether they were climbing an ice snow-covered mountain and got stranded in a you know, blizzard and hypothermia and no possibility for rescue or whether it was like the one I saw at the dentist where a family went for a nice picnic in the desert, which is what they live in, in Arizona. And as they were trekking through, they got a flat tire and they didn't know where they were. And I mean, it's like days in the desert without food or water, 72 days adrift on the ocean without anything and trying to survive catching fish on your little lifeboat. Um, all kinds of really scary, you know, stuck in the Amazon jungle for a month and crazy, crazy stories. And it just mesmerizes you. But one thing I noticed is Ariana and I, it's kind of our thing now. We, we get time in the evening and we watch it. Um, nobody prays. Like nobody asks God to help them in these shows. And then finally, just this week, we saw one where... It was an elderly couple lost in the desert, because again, the car flipped over, long story, um, and his wife can't handle it. She's dehydrated, her kidneys are shutting down, so he has to leave her. They're like 60, I don't say elderly, they're in their high 60s, 67, 68. Um, so he has to leave her, and he doesn't know if he'll be able to get rescued. So he's at his wit's end, three hours since he last saw her, so he's got to look for the best way to get into the, the car. Um, and he finally gets on his knees, and he just finds out she doesn't know, or he does not know what is happening. Gets on his knees and just prays and says, God, I know my wife and you haven't always seen eye to eye, but I'm begging you to save her and save us. And he literally said he opened his eyes and you can hear the chopper just coming. And he just started bawling like God answered my prayer, he said. And so I just, as I read this and I think about that, there are so many people in this world um, and they say there's no atheist in foxholes, but as I watch these shows, not many people ask God for, for help. And so when you think of the question, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What, what does that make you feel? Or how do you respond to that question? Did I hear, did I see a hand? Yes. I think it's, it's that believing means if I can give him my everything, what I, you know, surrender myself to him, that's what I can render to him, is just give myself to him and let him do the rest. And I wanted to, um, you were talking about this couple that were in the uh, desert and people that are supposedly, they're atheists, but if you notice, when they are in a time of trouble, then they realize that God exists. I had a friend once, um, never believed in God, always, oh, oh, I'm sorry, always, you know, 
he never believed in God until he was on his deathbed, till he was in so much pain. Until, and then he realized that God did exist. Mm -hmm. Now, um, he died, but um, of course I wasn't there when he died, so I don't know. I just know he started praying to God, yeah. you know, to take the pain away. So sometimes things, when, when we allow things to have, when, when things happen to us, it's when we really realize that God do exist and that he answers our prayers, that he is with us. Yes, amen, thank you. So what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Um, the inevitable, inevitable reply is to devote one's life to being faithful to God, right? Um, as I prepared for this lesson this week, there was so much emphasis on true spirituality is not a once a week event, right? It's not enough to come to church every Sabbath, um, or, I don't know, return your tithe and offering, um, not murder, not steal. Like, what true, you know, we'll, we'll get into it later, but those who worship God, the Bible says, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so there was a word I had to Google. It said worship is not capricious. I'm like, honey, do you know what capricious means? He's like, so I Googled it and it's like on a whim or sudden. Worship, you know, the Bible tells us how God wants to be worshiped. And just like my husband, my husband has his own love language. Um, one of the things he hates is praise. Believe it or not, like we all like affirmation and oh, Jenny, you did such a great job. Thank you for doing that. Oh, he'll like like don't even bother giving him that kind of affirmation like he just doesn't like it so I know how my husband likes to be loved and recognized and appreciated um, I'm not gonna do it the way I want to do it I'm gonna because I love him do it the way he wants to do it and so it's no different with our Creator right he has a certain way throughout the Bible, the psalmists talk about how God wants to be worshiped and how we're to honor him. Um, and so it's not whimsical in the sense that however we feel like it. So I thought that was another interesting point. Can we just have another question this one? So that is why I love the organization of the church. On Tuesday night, we have our Bible study and on Wednesday night, we have our prayer meeting. So it encourages us and it to tell us that um, worship is not just a one day thing. It's not just a Sabbath day thing. It keeps on going. And for those of us who can't do it by ourselves, the organization has made days to say, okay, let's come together and let's continue worship. I love that. Um, I want to piggyback on what Felicia said. Um, and like what you said, we need to have, or we should have, that form of worship daily with our children. I always push this, I don't know. People be like, why should you keep talking about it? Because when I first became a child of God in this church, I was taught that having worship with your husband, having worship, with your children is what God desires. And Sabbath is just the icing on the cake. We should be worshiping even in the supermarket. You're like, how can we worship in the supermarket? You could be worshiping in your mind, sharing the love of Jesus, having a smile on your face. People look and watch all the time. And we don't want to be sad Adventists or sad Christians. Sad Adventists. Sad Adventists. Yes, I want to say I didn't say it right. Sad Adventists. We want to be not saying we have to have a plaster smile on our face. We should not be without hope. 
because we have hope. You know, and worship is a thing. And I'm still really asking God to help me to develop a spirit of worship when I come into his house. I still ask him, even though I think I know, I still want to honor God by worshiping in reverence, because some are not reverence. You know, and what is reverence to people may not be reverence to me. So we have to be conscious of that. But I, I believe daily, and I know for me, I try to incorporate prayer and worship every day, even at work. You got that's the most challenging time to worship God. So, you know, remembering God is love and, and, and keeping his scriptures in, in my heart, I, I try to remember that um, I'm worshiping God by being in his presence mind-wise so it can reflect Jesus wherever I go. You know, and, that's why, and that's why it surprises me um, in my adult um, days right now that when it's asked to give a testimony or a praise, nobody wants to do it. You understand? Ellen G. White says, if it's the same thing that you have to give God thanks for every single day, you don't know who is hearing that praise. And your testimony may just be somebody else's praise. So piggybacking on daily worship, um, I have a little testimony from last night. So Arion has two... Um, friends at school. One is a little girl who lives on the same street as we do, and the other one lives across the street in another community. Um, they're both Catholic. They come from Catholic families. And over the year, um, one of them is a new friend from school, the one across the pond. And the other one over the years, they've been friends. The families have invited Arion to events at their Catholic church. Um, Typically, they're like little festivals where they have food and games. They're not really religious type ceremonies. And I've allowed Ariane to go to show her that, you know, collaboration, open mindedness. Um, so last night, one of the friends, the, the new one from across the pond, um, asked if they could sleep over at her house. Well, we haven't really had a sleepover on the Sabbath before. Um, but Ariane texts this friend throughout the week on my phone because she doesn't have texting. Um, and so anytime they talk in the evening, Ariane will say, sorry, got to go, have to go have family worship now. So it's kind of planted a little seed in this little girl's mind that, okay, my friend Ariane has family worship. I'm not sure what that is. Well, last night she had the opportunity to sleep over and I said, okay, it's time for family worship. And Ariane, I just love her because there are times when she can be so ornery. But last night was not one of those times. She says, okay, let's go have worship. And she comes, she brings her friend, and we say, okay, every night we do this. We just start out by saying one thing we're grateful for. So she had dinner with us, and she tried new Greek food, and. Her friend says she's grateful for trying that and being here with us. Then we pray, and then Arion reads the devotional thought. Um, and then after the devotional thought is read, each one goes around and says one thing we learned. And so they all did it. And then after we say what we learned, we each say a short prayer to end family worship. And so I said, Arion, would you like to start us off? She's like, sure, which she's not usually that eager. So I praise God she was being a witness to her friend last night. So she starts, I go, Carl goes, and then there was quiet, and my husband, trying to not make her feel uncomfortable, says, you don't have to do it if you want. She goes, I think I will. And then she says a little prayer, and you can tell she's not used to praying. And because, you know, usually in the Catholic Church they have, like, written specific prayers. You don't necessarily pray spontaneously from the heart. But she prays, we close, and you know they go to bed, we go to bed, and her mom picks her up early this morning, and that was it. And so my initial thought around having a Sabbath sleepover with a non 
Sabbath keeping friend was no, I gotta be the rule keeper. I can't let my daughter get contaminated. But you know, the Holy Spirit said, let's try this out. And because of that, this little girl, Catholic little girl got to experience a heartfelt family worship and a Bible reading and devotional. So I wholeheartedly agree with you that daily worship um, is critical. And because of those, you know, as we watch I Shouldn't Be Alive, you know, and all these people don't praise God or don't, Ariane's like, that's so God right there. That's totally God. And, you know, she's starting to get, you know, what we're trying to teach her. Okay, so we're still on the introduction, but it says, praising the Lord in the congregation is perceived as ideal worship. The individual's worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise. So while in turn individual worship develops its fullest potential in close relationship with the community. And so we've heard it, I'm sure you all have friends or colleagues or people you know who says, I don't need to go to church. I worship God just fine. I actually have a business partner recently who is Baptist or was Baptist and was a part of his huge Baptist church in Houston. He says, I can't tell you how many politicians and high-ranking, important people go to this church, how much money flows into this church. And he has been on that, like our board meetings, man, our board meetings, praise the Lord, they're so calm and they're so spirit-led, but he has experienced some crazy board meetings. He goes, I'm just done. Like, it's corrupt. I'm not, I don't want anything to do with it. I worship God at home. So I can understand when people have bad experiences in the community or congregation of the church. But <clears throat> what I always remember is that I don't go to church for pastor. I don't go to church to see Jetty. I don't go to church for anybody else but God because he told me to, right? And if there's a problem, I have been taught, instead of complaining and whining about it, try to be a part of the solution, right? Okay, so let's move on to Sunday's lesson entitled, Lift Up Your Hands in the Sanctuary. Will somebody please read Psalms 134? Okay, uh, Psalms 134, in my version, which is the international ver version, says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. So this is a very important, uh, which is very short, but very important, because we can, uh, we, can we, we cannot forget that there's a blessing just to congregate it. And, uh, uh, and there's a bless from, from Zion. So, uh, what tell me this is that uh, there's no uh, a place in the Sabbath. In fact, we are doing that even even in the new heaven, in the new earth, uh, even in heaven, uh, the, the people gathered it. All people for all the planets, they got it. A, 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 in 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 Earth, because this this is where finally at the end we will have a, a the, the the worship at the end. So there's a place that all people we have to go, a specific on on a Sabbath, and we we cannot substitute that 
to say, oh, I'm staying at home because of this or because of that. Uh, uh, of course, there are some valid reasons that we can stay at home. For example, if we are sick, then it's better to stay at home. But uh, uh, just because I feel better at home and, 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 and there's no reason to do that. We learn each other. We praise the Lord each other. We learn each other. We, we uh, minister each other. We listen each other. We learn each other. So, and, and after that, because he is, this is the time of gratitude. Because of the thing that we are receiving during the week, this is the time to gratitude, to give gra uh, the gratitude to, to the Lord. Yes, amen. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> One of the things in this um, verse, it says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Does anyone feel comfortable lifting up their hands in the sanctuary? Yeah. Okay, I know some of us from different cultural backgrounds do, but others of us have been taught that, you know, this is proper, this is the, but even in the Psalms, it talks about lifting up your hands. So mm -hmm. I just want to free anyone who might be feeling that this is like Pentecostal, you know, that it's okay to lift up your hands and praise God in the sanctuary. How do you react when you are happy? You don't sit down and say, oh my, I'm so happy. No, <laughs> it's, it's, you're showing that you're happy by your moving. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying that we're to jump up and, you know, do as you say Pentecostals do. But when you're happy and when you're moved by the Holy Spirit, you cannot be still. David was not, be, David was not still. Miriam, when she was, they were moving, they were happy. They did not sit, so. Yeah. I'm Sister. sorry if I lift my hands, people, but that's when the Holy Spirit moves me. Don't be sorry. The Bible says lift up your hands. Sister Carol. What I learned from uh, watching the YouTube, uh, one of the pastors said, when you hold up your arms and open up your arms to God, you're opening up your whole body. You're giving yourself to him. This is, this is offering yourself to him. So this is... The, you know, opening up yourself to him and the Holy Spirit pouring into you. So. And it's, it's kind of symbolic, right? Like a surrender, yeah. an opening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last question, though, on, on that last psalm said, what are the results of your praise? You know, I have a testimony that uh, I'd like to share. <clears throat> Carol and I have... We sit at the breakfast table and, stu and uh, study the Sabbath school lesson. And in the evenings, we, we have a uh, reading after Carol's guitar lessons, and then she sings some gospel songs, and we, we praise the Lord. So, you know, what's the result of that? <clears throat> well, this week, I decided, we decided to take this large tree down in our backyard, and I called a tree company, and they come out, and they wanted to do it today. I said, no, I can't do it today on Saturday. Well, why not? Well, I go to church Saturday. <clears throat> on the Saturday? God said, yeah. It's the seventh day. I said, the Bible says, six days that I labor and do all their work. On the seventh day is the Sabbath. And I said, you have a calendar? Look to see which the seventh day is. Well, he didn't have a calendar, but he was a real nice person. Anyway, they, did, they came out yesterday. And I've never had a tree taken down as neat and as efficient as those people did. So that was our result of our, our praise. I, I, I gave God credit for that. Amen. And, and you're right, Brother Ben. It says, the blessing is the underlying principle and outcome of the relationship between God and Israel. The people bless God in the sanctuary, and God blesses his people. And so when we come on Sabbath to worship, it's to seek his blessing, because this is what he says he will give us, his favor, his blessing. And then we bless him. Believe it or not, in our frail humanity, he still receives blessing 
from our worship. Um, it also talks about several different psalms praising God in his courts, in his house. It says, because the Israelites worshiped the invisible God who could not be represented in the form of any image, the sanctuary served to reflect the glory of the Lord and provide a secure environment for sinful people to approach their holy king. This made me think of the way I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. And we just spent some time with my Greek family in Canada over spring break. And, you know, it just kind of brought me back to my childhood because they're all still Greek Orthodox. And, uh, you know, my aunt has a little altar um, where she worships. Um, with different like crosses and incense and icons of saints and things. Um, and then they have phylacteries, which are things, religious things that you wear for protection. Whether it's like the evil eye to keep away evil or, you know, the cross um, or little bracelets with different symbols and such. And, it just reminded me that, you know, it's in the commandments. Don't make any graven image, don't worship them. And of course, you ask them and they say, we don't worship them. It's just how we show our veneration, respect, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, it ends up being respect of saints and turns into praying to saints and it all gets convoluted. And so, um, Again, because the Bible forbids these kind of things, phylacteries and making graven images and bowing before them, we come before God in the sanctuary. And this is where our mind really gets turned to him. And then we refocus for the week and continue our daily worship. Um, it says, let's see, you also, this is 1 Peter 2, 4, 5. Are, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament expression of these same ideas presented in the Psalms, that of God's people, now a holy priesthood, offering praise and thanksgiving to their Lord Jesus Christ, their creator and redeemer, for all the good things he has done for them. And then it says, as New Testament believers, we also have a priestly role and that we are called to mediate the good news of the gospel to the world. Amen. And the question for the congregation is, what are the most effective ways we can do this? How can we be good priests and mediate the good news of the gospel to the world. You know, and I'm, I'm asking for specific examples, not like high level, right? Like what are real ways we can do this? You mean to minister, to be priest? Yeah, to be priest, that's right. To other people. To other people. Well, I, I believe in that, that our light, our light having Jesus light in us in what we say and do, even at work, people can say there's something different about you because you carry yourself different. You, 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 you try to, specifically, I'll use me because you, you always use yourself as an example. When I started a new job, yay, I got the job. Oh, okay. Yes, and um, I said, God, I am, because I've been in I've been in an environment that was very toxic, you guys. I really did not want to go to work. And I said, God, you have to use me. And God used me. And I just, I said, God, this job, if you, not if, when you bless me, that you would use me to be an example of your glory, not my glory, your glory. So I know when I interact with the, the teachers, um, they like they ask me questions because I carry, I actually carry my um, my gratitude journal along with my paperwork. So in between doing that, he said, like, "I noticed you always writing." 
people always watching you guys. People watch you everywhere, in your neighborhood, at church, they're watching you now. They watch you everywhere. So they, I notice you just carry that, you know, and you're always taking notes. Yes, I'm taking notes. And, and one lady in particular asked me what I was writing when I was on my down, downtime. And I said, I have a gratitude journal. She said, really, you have a gratitude journal? I said, I write 10 things that I'm grateful for every day to God, and then I write a little prayer. So when I say that, because people watch and they want to know, and they will ask you if they're bold enough to ask you about what makes you smile. One little boy said, you always smiling. Why are you always smiling? I'm like, wow. He asked me, why am I always smiling? Like, what do you, what do you, people can see that. Even little children can see it. I want to give some kudos. I thank God for Carol and for Nancy and for my friends over here. <laughs> that when I, I can tell, I can tell because of the love they exude. So sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You just smile and your attitude. It's something about your presence. It's the Holy Spirit that ministered to people through you. And they can tell. People, you cannot fool people. You especially can't fool children because yeah. they know. They know love. So that is my example, being that Jesus. I present Jesus wherever I go, especially at work. I mm. love that because it's not about one certain action, like preaching on a street corner or handing out tracts. It's about every daily interaction with everyone you come in contact with. I love that. It's really hard, really hard, I can tell you. Even when I'm sad, I still try my best to praise him. And I just moved into a new job. And before I moved into my new job, because I work, I'm a United States public health officer now, but before I was working at Memorial Hermann as an educator, and every day that I would go to work as the educator, my colleagues would ask me, um, good morning, how are you doing? And I'm always honest, I'm like, I'm just not feeling it today. And they would stop. And then I would let them know what happened. But then at the end of it, I said, I'm still giving God praise because it could have been worse. Mm -hmm. And because of that, in the week they called me and they said, Felicia, I miss you. And I said, why? I thought you'd forget about me by now. They said, I miss those little pep talks. So even when I'm down, I'll try to give God thanks. And I am a witness to them because they know that there are certain foods I don't eat. So when they're ordering, they will say, remember, Felicia, don't eat bacon. Felicia, don't eat pork. Felicia, don't eat shrimp. So they're always looking out for me. And now that I'm in this new job, I try to let them know there's, I don't do things on Sabbath. When it comes to sunset on Friday, that's it for me. In the mornings, this is what I do. And yesterday they say, oh, Felicia, we are going um, today, Saturday, for a volunteer service at a school. But I know you will be in church. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. At least it starts. <laughs> and you know, I love that example because someone said, I don't remember who it was, that okay, it doesn't mean if you're a Christian, you have to go around like yeah. this, yeah. right? Yeah. It's better than going around like this, wow. but we have to be real. Right. We have to be transparent. We live in a hard world, yeah. a sinful world, where we are not immune to all the evil, and sometimes that really affects us in a very hard way. And so I love the transparency that you can show despite I'm having a hell of a week. I'm still holding on, like Job, to the Lord, because he will work it out. And that people want real, right? They don't want fakeness. OK, Monday's lesson, sing to the Lord a new song. So there are several verses here. For the sake of time, we're not going to read them. But they all talk about singing a new song to the Lord. What does it mean? to sing a new song to the Lord. For example, me, I can't sing. 
Okay, I can sing, but nobody should hear it because like, it would just not be good for you. And so what does it mean in spirit to sing a new song to the Lord? week of prayer for the youths. It was wonderful, guys. It was really um, spirit-filled. Um, the Pathfinder pledge says we're to always keep a song in our heart. So when you're down, there's always a song on your lips. It, it could, and that's why it's very important to have daily worship. And when you're having worship, you should always go to our hymnal. There are, there, on, um, 3AB, no, it's Hope Channel. When they're having um, Sabbath school, um, the pastor's wife always um, creates a song from the psalm, and they always sing it. And uh, trust me, those are always new songs, and they're coming from the psalm. Yes. Always have a song on your lips, so when someone asks you, you will always have a praise. And you know, for someone like me who doesn't have that musical talent, like our beautiful ladies in the back, Nicole and Julia, um, it's not, when I think of what it means to sing a new song, I think someone else said earlier, can't remember who it was, but for example, I became a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian when I was 16. I have this incredible life-changing testimony that I've literally, you know, told to 3,000 students at Andrews University from chapel, you know, told it everywhere I went for years and years. And as I grew older, I'm 45 now, can you believe it? Um, as, my, as our daughter called us, we're old geezers now, that's what she calls us, old geezers from the olden days, whatever. Um, so, um, what is my new song, right? My old song was that life-changing experience when I was 16. My new song, the Lord's mercies are fresh every morning, every day. And so every single day, every single week, I have new testimonies that happen at work, at home, out wherever I am. And to me, that's my new song, right? It may not be a beautiful musical presentation, but it is a song in my heart. Yes, sister. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. What I got from the lesson, what I understood was that um, you have a song in your heart because you are grateful for every little thing. So it's like a, a new experience, a new gratefulness, and that is going to cost, you know, gonna cost you to have that song, be happy, but you're thankful that he's, answer, he's helping you, he's protecting you all the time. I love that. That's really what it is. It, it's a song that bursts out from gratitude. I love that. Um, so to summarize Monday's lesson, it says, God's people Israel is depicted in affectionate terms as a people near to him, implying that all the creation, of all the creation, Israel has the most special status and thus is most obliged and privileged to praise God. So if you stop there, you could see how the Israelites felt elitist mm -hmm. and better than thou and better than everyone, but that wasn't the intention of God. The Bible thus encourages believers of all generations to sing the new song in praise of their Redeemer which carries their unique testimony about salvation and the blood of the Lamb. A new song can depict a fresh song that no one has ever heard before, a song that commemorates a vivid experience of God's grace in one's life. And so that's, yes, brother. That part is very important because we forget that, that a, a, to praise the Lord is also to proclaim the evangelistic gospel. So, so we're thinking, so, so what we learned this week is that the word uh, praise 
it's a very big word. It, 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 com it completes, it comprehends a lot of things. There's no specific things for, for uh, worship. Worship is a big word uh, that is not a specific things that occur only in the temple. But we uh, usually forget that worship is to proclaim, to proclaim to others, to proclaim the gospel. And there's a, a relationship, if I can say in that way, in that way with uh, Psalms 96, 1, for example, and Revelation 5, uh, when they said to worship in, 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 in the new heaven and earth when, when Jesus is uh, uh, resurrected and he is uh, in heaven, which is this Revelation 5 talks about. Uh, so what we are learning is that uh, worship is, com uh, is include proclamation, include the evangelistic gospel. So it includes that we have to share the message. That is worship as well. Amen. Thank you, brother. So I was just given the five-minute signal by our brother Aaron. So I just want to recap. Um, we started out talking about our worship of God is never going to end. It's not just here on earth. It's sinful humans. It'll be when we're perfect and mortal throughout all eternity. Then we talked about lifting up our hands in the sanctuary and the, how God encourages that. We talked about singing a new song to the Lord and having a new testimony daily of his goodness, our gratitude for his goodness. I want to close on, unfortunately, just Tuesday's lesson. We're going to talk about Psalm 15. And it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walks uprightly, work is righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not, he that puts not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. So now we're going to close on who may abide in your tabernacle. And so I just want to clarify two things. God can save to the uttermost anyone who comes to him. doesn't matter what you've done in your past. He will forgive you, throw it in the depths of the ocean, and never look back. Once God gives us this conversion experience, and now we have the privilege of worshiping in his tabernacle, these are the characteristics he expects of us to walk uprightly, to be righteous, to not backbite other people, gossip, to speak the truth, to not do evil, to not collect interest when you lend money, apparently. <laughs> it's all in there. And so going down in, in Psalm 23, 3 to 6 and 101, 1 to 3, it says, God wants us to have clean hands and a pure heart. So there is no such thing as cheap grace where you're saved and you're going to stay in your sins and keep being a backbiter and an evildoer and associating with people who do, you know, commit adultery and all these things. No, God says, if you want to abide in my tabernacle, he talks about a perfect heart. And that is someone whose speech is entirely truthful restored by God's forgiveness. A blameless life springs from the acknowledgement of God's grace and his righteousness. So in closing, how can we make conscious choices to avoid the things that push us away from God? 
What are some of those things and how can we avoid them? Prayer, I hear prayer can help us. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing, give your life to Jesus. First thing you do. And Pastor John is turning 90 this year, so I think he knows what he's talking about. Amen? Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for your participation. As always, let us bow our heads and close in prayer. Dear Father, thank you so much for your mercies that are fresh and new every morning. Help us to truly be grateful for everything you do for us. And when we come to praise you in your tabernacle, may we not just come to seek a blessing, but to be a blessing to all those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. A short drive from Houston.
All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, let, let me try this again just to get your attention to confirm that you are with me at this moment. Uh, happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. All right, um, <clears throat> I'm encouraging everyone to join us on the inside at this moment. But, but when you know we ask everyone to be on the inside, is you know that we're going to deal with an important matter, all right? All right, so this item has been in our announcement for at least uh, the last four weeks. And that is the formation of the nominating committee.
personal ministries department, which is Danny and Jeannie Thompson, and distributing the Great Controversy books. That's going to be on Aldine Westfield and Spring Creek Drive. Yes, so if you guys can help out with that, just um, meet Danny or Jeannie after church if you can uh, assist with passing out the books. Also, today we're going to have our vegetarian potluck, um, our monthly vegetarian potluck. It's going to be over in the fellowship hall. For those that are visiting with us today, we would love you guys to stay and just fellowship with us. We'll be right across the hall, and we have a, a nice vegetarian meal prepared for you. So please join us after church for that. Delicious. It is delicious. Yes, it is. Um, also, next week's uh, Saturday, we have our women's ministry prayer breakfast. That's going to be happening next week, uh, next week at 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall. If any women um, are able to bring any breakfast items, just see Sister Edeline Mutenga. She's not here this morning, but um, see her if you can bring anything for that breakfast and just come and pray with your church sisters next Saturday. Also, next Saturday, we have our Pathfinders that are going to be leading out in service. So please just come out and support the youth, support the Pathfinder organization, Lord, um, the Pathfinder organization as they lead out in our church service this upcoming Sabbath. And as always, our last um, announcement for this morning, our Wednesday night prayer meeting is always happening every week. The Zoom credentials, you will see it on the screen shortly, and it's also in your bulletin to log into that. So please join us for that weekly prayer as well. Uh, does anyone have any last minute announcements they wanna give? If not, let us just prepare ourselves to worship and praise the Lord together in the house of the Lord this morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Spring Creek Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, both those of you that are here, thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to recognize and welcome those that are watching online, whether you're watching today or at a later date. Um, remember that uh, the way this social media stuff works is that the more interaction you have with it, the more it's exposed to others. So if you get a blessing from the service today from uh, YouTube, please uh, click the like button, think about subscribing to the channel. That will actually uh, make it more likely that others uh, see and maybe get the same blessing uh, that we hope you get today. Um, just a couple of things that um, we as the elders want to remind um, everybody. Uh, we want to respect and show reverence to the house of God. Amen? Amen. So there's a couple of things that we want to remind people. Um, we just got this beautiful sanctuary upgraded, um, uh, and we want to kind of preserve the, uh, the new carpet and the new pews. And one of the ways that we do that is by keeping food and drink out of here. And that's kind of... Uh, important when we're when we're in the house of God as far as reverence goes as well um, and we also want everybody to have um, 
an experience where they are blessed and where they're able to hear and understand what's going on. So we ask that people that want to have conversations do it outside the sanctuary. And also at the end of the service, um, we have our deacons who will come and usher people out. Um, and as they come to your row, we ask that you uh, respond to them and that you actually move on out of the sanctuary. The place to visit um, is, is our fellowship hall and our hallways and outside the sanctuary. And we're going to try to preserve uh, God's house for the, the worship and praise of him. Um, we love that, uh, that we have fellowship and that we get to visit and make friends with each other, but we specifically have a fellowship hall for that. So we, we ask that you do it here. Also, um, after service, our prayer team meets up front here and, uh, they need, they need that, uh, that quiet and that reverence, uh, for that. So we ask that you just observe, uh, the deacons and, and when they're acting as ushers and that you move on out. Um, praise God that he has brought us to another Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't know about you, but I, uh, um, I work hard and, uh, I take one day off a week as God commanded. And it's nice to just rest and set everything aside, set all our cares aside and just have a day that we spend with our creator remembering as he told us in the commandment that it's a day to remember him as the creator of all and as the reason we are here amen, amen. Um, shall we bow our heads our dear heavenly father we thank you so much for bringing us here today we pray that your holy spirit will be here in this sanctuary with us today we pray that every word that comes through this microphone will be from you. We pray that every song we sing uh, will be in glory to you. We pray that every um, th thought and word and deed um, is for your glory and honor. And that we remember that the reason why we're here today is to praise you, is to worship you, is to study and learn more about you, but most importantly, it's to prepare to go out in the world and tell others about you before it's too late. We pray that we will be ever reminded of our mission as a church, and that is to prepare ourselves, our children, our families, and those around us, our neighbors, our friends, and the world to prepare for your soon imminent coming. And we pray that you will uh, bless us in that mission as you remind us of it daily. We pray that we will daily surrender to you and daily remember that sin is following our own selfish desires and salvation comes from accepting your grace, from accepting your forgiveness, from accepting the the sacrifice that you gave for us and by surrendering totally to your will. Lord, we thank you for the hope that comes uh, from the blood of Jesus Christ, and we praise you for your love and for your salvation. In Christ's name, amen. amen. This morning I'm going to read a little bit from the Sermon on the Mount. And this is from Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 3. These are the words of Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evils against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets 
which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its favor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to cast out and to be trodden under the feet of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets I am come to not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot and one tittle shall in no wise go from the law till it be fulfilled. Whomsoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said of old that they, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of just judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of counsel. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembered that thy brother hath aught against you, leave your gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer the gift. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath, church. Come to be 
Amen, amen. It is so good to be here this morning, um, praising the Lord. And if God has done something good for you this week, I want you to praise him as if he has. Feel free to sing with us. We're here to worship, not to entertain, so we're here to praise together. My God is awesome, He can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened, forever He will Oh 
Amen. Amen. I want you to join with us in worshiping. I want you to join with us in worshiping. And by joining with us in worshiping, I want you to either stand, I want you to clap your hands, I want you to sing, I want you to praise God this morning. Amen. All right, so don't give us that there in the headlights there. I want you to worship with us, okay? Worship with us. Sing, clap, shout, stamp your feet, raise your hand, give God a hallelujah. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like us. My Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.
right, so that was much better than the first one. I know we can do much better than we just did. So on this next song, I want us to, to praise God because he is worthy of our praise. Yeah. Right?
trying to come for us but he can't win he cannot win the praise will go on and with that I ask you to stand for our opening hymn hymn 618 stand up stand up for Jesus singing, uh, sounding, sounding real good. Uh, I, I just have one uh, final aspect of the um, process we started earlier on. I'm going to invite Sister Vivian to come forward at this moment to present to the church a report from the organizing committee. Good morning, church family. So the organizing committee recommend the following persons uh, for the nominating committee. Melissa Miko, George Bunderveer, Angela Collins, David Freeman, and Diane Hendrickson. And as a chairperson, uh, the organizing committee recommends George Bunderveer, and as secretary, Melissa Miko. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to invite those individuals, please, to stand at this moment uh, so we can uh, once again confirm who those persons are. Um, 
who is missing? Okay, so we have Angela, Melissa, David, George, and assistant director. All right, all right, awesome, awesome. And now ask for a motion from the floor that we accept these members as uh, members of the nominating committee. Yes. All right, it's moved and seconded. Uh, any question? Any comment? All right, uh, all in favor, please show by uplifted right hand. Uh, those who oppose by the same sign, thank you, it is carried. I bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for the call to mission. Thank you so much for the call in place on these brothers and sisters at this moment. They have been challenged and given a, a awesome task. And so, Father, we ask that you will bless them, uh, give them the, the right vision, the right mindset as they meet to, together to consider officers to serve for the ensuing year. May we as a church give them the support that is needed. May we keep them constantly in our prayers so that you will will be done. Bless them, bless their families, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Vivian, and uh, thanks to all those who have accepted to serve on the nominating committee and to the organizing committee. Thank you so much. I believe the church is satisfied with your recommendation, and we look forward uh, sometime in the near future for a report from the nominating committee. God bless. Good morning, church. Good morning. There used to be a gentleman here, Mr. Uh, that always stood up here and says, Good morning, church. And I believe he's been brought back to us by Damien because he comes and says, Good morning, church. And he wants to hear a response back. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. About 144 years ago, there was a group of people standing on a rock on the East Coast waiting for Jesus to return in 1844 in response to that verse in Galatians where the sanctuary will be cleansed. And there was a great disappointment. It's called the Great Day of Disappointment. But those group of people stuck together. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church today is the results of their work throughout the world and, and that goal is to reach the whole world. And we are the light of the world. This little church here was part of that group that's grown. And these small churches and large churches throughout the world has grown because of the faithful people. Yeah. That could only be done through offerings, free will offerings. The Lord asks us to give back the blessings that he's given us. So as our, we take our offering today, let's remember that small group, that we're a, a part of that group that's grown over the last hundred and some or so years. <laughs> so as the deacons will come forward, we will take up the offering at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to let our light shine, to support the group, support this mission. And our mission is not to establish a kingdom on earth we want to be part of that kingdom in heaven bless this offering today lord we pray in jesus name amen, amen. amen. bruno and natalia wondering why this foreign couple would want to learn his native language are you christians he asked finally the young missionaries hesitated. They had just arrived in the Middle East and planned to settle in a neighboring country where it was forbidden to speak about Jesus openly. However, as they needed to learn the local language, they asked if Khan would be willing to teach them. We were afraid to answer that question, said Natalia later, but we couldn't help it. Praying silently that God was in control, we said yes, but the couple wasn't prepared for Khan's answer. I will gladly do that. 
And then he added very quietly, because I'm studying the Bible. Taken by surprise, Bruno and Natalia looked at each other. That night, they asked God to help them be a blessing to Khan and to allow him to learn more about the Word of God. Khan surprised them in the second language class again by opening his bag and taking out a Bible. During that same class, Khan asked Bruno what he did in his home country. Bruno said that he had studied theology. Then Khan asked, and what are you doing here? Hesitantly, Bruno told him the truth, that he was a pastor. Khan looked at him, dumbfounded. So, can you help me learn more about the Bible, he said. I would love to, Bruno replied, thanking God for answering his prayer. Khan's family also began to study the Bible. Khan began attending church on Sabbath with Bruno and Natalia. During that period, all the sermons were focused on the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Adventist faith. After several months of studying the Bible with Bruno and Natalia, Khan asked for baptism. Bruno and Natalia are engaged in the Waldensian Student Initiative. This missionary project brings Adventist students from around the world to live, study, and serve at secular universities located within specific countries of the 1040 window. Following Christ's example of evangelism, they connect with people, earn their trust, meet their needs, and when the opportunity arises, invite them to follow Jesus. Bruno and Natalia sacrificed a life of ease and convenience, dedicating themselves entirely to God's cause. You may also become an Adventist volunteer and dedicate your whole life or just a period to exclusively serve the Lord. You may access the Adventist Volunteer Service at adventistvolunteers.org or Vivid Faith, another missionary agency, at vividfaith.com. When you return your tithe and your promise, which is your regular and systematic offering, and distribute it as suggested by the combined offering plan, you are also sacrificing to advance God's cause locally, regionally, and internationally. As we return our tithes and promise offering, may we put our desires last in God first. Hi, I'm Carol Stevens, and I want to, uh, for the first time, give you uh, the intercession, uh, intercession prayer. Anyway, so could you please come forward and kneel before, uh, before the throne of grace if you feel like so, and if you don't and you can't, you can kneel where you are at. Dear Heavenly Father, our Creator, our God of the universe, thank you for being here with us. Please pour out your Holy Spirit today and enable me to speak clearly and, com and correctly because this is the first time I've ever done this. So I need your help and uh, your words, Lord. Um, Father, I pray today for our salvation and I pray for our peace. And I pray today to feel your presence and your mercy and your grace to be upon the, all of us here. And I humbly come before you today and seeking spiritual revival and renewal for this church and across the whole universe and the globe. God, lift up our intercessory prayers to you for the needs of our loved ones and our friends. Look into our hearts and answer them, if you will. May our worship be filled with authentic, reflecting, 
our, your, our, your power and your presence that's here today. Father, there is so much to praise you for. Our families, our loved ones, our homes, our peace, our health. Thank you so much, God. We praise you, Lord, for this congregation because of its friendly love in it and the care that we share for each other. We praise you for the many young people who are our future. Bless the teachers and the leadership that have been given to them. We ask you to watch over us and lead us in each of our paths closer to you each day. Forgive us our sins and fill us with your Holy Spirit and wash them away and make us wipe our sins white as snow so that we are prepared for the day when you return for us so we can be cleansed, Lord, and be your children. Father, please bless our pastor and fill his words with blessings of the Holy Spirit and open our hearts and open our minds to understand them. Thank you, Jesus. And we thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. You know, when I contacted the Stevens this week and asked uh, if Carol would do the intercessory prayer, um, she indicated, as she indicated to you, that it was the first time and that she was a little scared and nervous. But she didn't say no. You know, in the next uh, few weeks, as the nominating committee is doing their work, I pray that you will pray for them, for God's leading for them. And when your phone rings, I pray that you once again will pray um, seeking the Lord's will, but that you be willing to step up and do what he's calling you to do, even if it takes you out of your comfort zone. Because you know what they say, God doesn't just call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Amen. And uh, I'll tell you what, when I uh, stumbled into this church, just a few years back for prayer meeting and quit drinking just a couple days later, I never imagined that one day I would be standing before you as the head elder, and I never asked for it. But they used to hand out these sheets from the nominating committee saying, put on here what, you, uh, what you'd like to do in the church, and I never filled one out. I'm, I'm not suggesting that you do this. Please... Please let us know if there's something you're available for. But I the reason I never filled one out is because I always said a prayer, God, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do for you. I want you to tell me. Um, so please prayerfully wait for that phone call from the nominating committee. Um, we have a couple of changes to our, uh, to our program today that I wanted to let you know. Uh, and first off, we have a special... Uh, piece of special music from Jenny Harris and after that the the uh, bulletin says that the um, children's story will be told by Warner Chaplin. Warner's not here today but fortunately for us Warner has a daughter Amen. so uh, Nicole Vanderveer will be uh, telling the uh, children's story after after special music. Thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Morning, happy Sabbath. <laughs> In relation to the song we will be singing today, I will read you Mark chapter 4, verse 37 and 39. And there arose
arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat unto the ship, so that it was now full. And he arose and rebuked the wind, saying unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. It is in these times that we must remember the promise of Psalms chapter 37, verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. so troubled you don't think you count at all ways may seem like mountains when your boat is all so small but somewhere past the clouds ways a new day to begin sometimes it takes a storm to come Stone within. Sometimes it takes a storm to know you need a shelter. When the anchors in your life. Sometimes the wind rage before your sail come waters. Sometimes it takes a storm to find. Cried out to the master, please save us or we'll drown. Jesus heard the cries, and mercy still the way. Sometimes it takes a storm to see the sun again. Sometimes it takes a storm to know you need a shelter when the anchors in your life disappear without a trace. Sometimes the wind rage before your sail come waters. Sometimes it takes a storm to find the hiding. Storm. 
children, it's time for our children's story. Okay, guys, I don't know if any of our church members drives a gray infinity and is parked over by the school but if you do they're getting ready to lock up that parking space so you might want to move your car a gray infinity Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Oh, no, I only heard one little girl and one little boy back there. <laughs> Can I have all the little girls and boys? Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. It's so nice to see your faces. This morning, I have a story about a little boy. Does anybody know who this little boy is? He's sitting with us today. Who's that? That's Asa. That's right, Jacinka. That's Asa. <laughs> right behind you. Asa, raise your hand. There's Asa. That's my, that's my son. And I'm going to tell you a little story about Asa when he was about two or three. Is there anybody here that's that young? Yes, okay. Anybody who's about two or three? Well, two or three is very young. They're just just starting to walk and move around a lot. And I, I did, I told this story in, uh, in Sabbath school this morning. So Asa, we, we, the whole family, we went to the zoo. Has anybody been to the Houston Zoo? Oh, it's such a busy place, right? Well, we all went to the zoo. It was packed that day. It was hot, it was summertime, it was so busy. And George and I, you know, we were, we were, running around, trying to keep track of all the kids. And, and um, I went to the bathroom, 
and we were heading to the restrooms. And while we were heading to the restrooms, there were some drums off to the side, some little drums. And Asa kept pulling us and wanting to go to the drums. And I said, no, no, we got to go to the bathroom. We got to go to the restroom first. So we went to the restroom. I, I thought, I don't know, there was a communication problem between Mr. George and myself. He thought I had Asa. I thought he had Asa. Oh. So we went to the restrooms, came out, and I looked at George, Mr. George, and I said, where's Asa? And he said, I thought you had Asa. And can you imagine losing a little two- or three-year-old at the Houston Zoo? Ooh, it was scary. So I said, oh, no. And the, it felt like everything started spinning because I got so scared. And it was loud. It was very noisy. There were a lot of people. And I said, I, I remember I thought, oh, Lord, help me because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start looking or what to do. And I heard off in the distance, dun, 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 dun. I heard these drums. And I, and I thought, oh. And I said to Mr. George, I said, oh, those drums. And then I thought, the drums. And I ran over to the drums, and there was Asa playing with the drums. And I thought, you know what? I know, I know that the Lord spoke to me in that moment and helped me find Asa in that very chaotic zoo. So there was also, there was somebody in the Bible who God kind of whispered to and spoke to. Do you guys know who that is? Who's? It was actually the prophet Elijah. I'm going to tell you the memory verse that goes with his story. So 1 Kings 19, 12 says, After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. So the prophet Elijah, I'm just going to give you a real short um, explanation about who he is, but he's a prophet. And he was facing a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, and people were threatening his life. So do you think he was scared? Yeah, if somebody was threatening my life and people didn't like me and were angry at me. So Prophet Elijah felt very discouraged and afraid, so he ran to Mount Sinai or Horeb. And while he was on that mountain, he experienced a lot of really powerful things. Fire, um, powerful winds, earthquakes. And I think sometimes people think when God speaks to them, it's through really big events. But God did not speak to the prophet Elijah through these events. He actually spoke to Elijah. Shh, let's listen. Let's listen. He spoke to the prophet Elijah if, with a small whisper, a small voice. And this reassured the prophet Elijah, and it gave him strength to continue on his mission and to continue to tell people about, about Jesus. So when we're feeling overwhelmed with big feelings, feeling scared, sad, this can even go for the children who are sitting back there who are too big to be up here, but when you're feeling a lot of big feelings, you're feeling overwhelmed, scared. Sometimes we just need to sit quietly with God, and he will tell us and help us to understand what we need to do and where we need to go, okay? But God is always communicating with us. He's always talking to us, right, Pastor John? Yeah. Okay, so let's always remember that. Does anybody want to have a prayer for this? Okay, Olivia, you too. You start first. Daddy, yeah. Please I have a nice beautiful day. Please I have a good dream. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're gonna get more than two. Okay. Dear God, thank you for the plants and trees and animals. Thank you for the time we're being us with you here today and thank you for everything you did. Thank you for everything you did for us and we pray, Amen. Amen. Thank you for the days of love the Lord. Thank you for the days of the man. Amen. 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 Dear God, please help every single go good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for another day. I love my mom. I drop in the water. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys can go back to your seats. Thanks for being good listeners.
who's able to restore my soul. Come and make me whole. Breathe on me. Power of God, come in and change me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me once again welcome everyone to church. We're very happy that you are here. And um, if you do have a time after the message today to uh, join those uh, in the fellowship hall for potluck, that would be lovely. And also, if you do have the time to um, be with the personal ministry team, uh, Brother and Sister Thompson, and some others will be distributing the great controversy 
uh, out there at Aldin West. And so if you have a time to join them, that would be nice. And there'll be another opportunity um, soon that they will inform you of if you can't make it today to be a part of that. Um, I believe we're all happy to have um, Diane back. Amen. To have her back at the keyboard also. Um, she, she's a little bit dreaded, I believe. Um, they traveled from um, California. Um, I, I wasn't expecting her to be here today, knowing how many days they have to travel far to, to be here, but was so happy that you are here with our sister Diane. And she loved the Pathfinder uh, uh, program so much, and they are meeting um, after potluck today, and she wants to ensure that things uh, go very well with them, and Matt has been doing a very good job uh, with, with his team over um, since he has taken this role. Once again, um, so glad for all our visitors that you have decided to worship here with us today. Uh, pray that all of us will experience God's blessing. Um, this, is, this is the last uh, in the last presentation on our series for this quarter, focusing on the Ten Commandments. Um, and we, we will be looking in the next quarter in other fundamental, a foundational doctrine of the church, and starting next, starting the first Sabbath in, in April, We'll be having a study on the sanctuary. Amen. Amen. So we, we, we look forward to, to, to that and uh, hope that you, you will be here. <laughs> you know, I was looking on the, on, the, on, the, on the monitor at the back, and so I didn't know that we were already up there. Um, I must confess. Um, we're going further. I'm so happy to have Sister Doris back. Uh, Sister Fraser is back with us. Um, for some, she, she went away for about three, three months, and uh, that, that you're back with us. We, we, we're happy to have you back. Um, and please don't plan to travel anytime soon. We might have to post somebody out at the airport to ensure that you stay with us. Uh, but it's, it's good to see you back in good health. Um, um, brothers and sisters, um, The messages that have been preached for the last three months or so, they are from the Bible, and we have to preach them because it's God's word. Right. Uh, I crave your prayer, your prayers. I am just a messenger. I am not the message. All right? Today's subject is uh, entitled, The Truth Matters. And somebody might be wondering, uh, that's the ninth commandment. Um, Elder Freeman last week preached on the tenth commandment, and he did a very good job. Yes. Very good job. If you listen to his content, I guarantee you that you would learn a lot of stuff and can apply a lot of stuff in your life. All right? Um, and so, Ella Freeman, I want to thank you so much for standing in the gap for, for me while I was with the brethren um, in Zion. The truth matters. Can I tell you about uh, Jane, Jess, and Mary as I get into the message for today? So, so Jane was, was in her house, and she... She heard, a, she heard her gate open. When she peeped through the window, she realized that it was Jess coming through the gate. And Jess is a long-metered woman. He's her good friend and her neighbor. But when Jess comes over, she will talk for the entire so Jane didn't have that time, so Jane quickly devised a plan. She called her daughter Mary and said, I am going to the back room to hide. 
when Jess knock on the door, open and tell her that I am not here. Show to form. Jess knock on the door. Mary opened. And Mary, the little daughter, looked at Jess and said, Mommy gone to the back room and she told me to tell you that she's not here. <laughs> The truth matters. One of the morals of the story is that children don't know how to lie. Amen, Amen little children, Amen. until you teach them how to lie. Yeah. Father, thank you so much for this word. Open our hearts now, we pray. And bless and give me the strength that is needed to deliver your message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, friends, uh, the more I read the Bible, and since I've been studying the Ten Commandments, the more I am convinced that the Holy Bible was not composed and preserved by mere human efforts. I believe that if I were one of those writers, or if it were left up to me, and probably some people who are here, that we would not record some things in the Bible. I probably, because I want you to believe in the Bible so much, I would not record Noah's drunkenness. And some folks would dare to hide Father Abraham's unfaithfulness. Some would probably spiritualize Moses' anger, sanitize David's record as it relates to his moments of weakness. I believe some folks, like myself, would conceal Jeremiah's suicidal mode and cover Peter's attempt to murder Malchus. And I believe some others, if they do record it in the Bible, they would spin Paul's heated displeasure with John Mark. Today, like Peter, I am in agreement that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, God tells it as it is. Only a holy God who is just, gracious, loving, faithful, and merciful would dare to tell the truth, the old truth, and nothing but the truth. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 6.18 says that it is impossible for God to lie. And brothers and sisters, friends, I am so glad that I can trust God. I can believe all he says, and I can stand by his word. I'm so glad that I serve a God with whom it is impossible for him to lie. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Titus 1 and verse 2, Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world begun. The fact that God cannot lie speaks to his nature. God can only speak the truth. No circumstance can ever occur in which God will depart from the truth. Are you still with me? This declaration, brothers and sisters, in uh, Titus 1 and verse 2, and by Paul in Hebrews 6, 19, is the foundation of our hope and our salvation. God cannot lie. And if he promised eternal life to us, we can rest assured that we will receive it. 
As a matter of fact, James says that there is no veilableness in him, no shadow of turning. Malachi say he is unchangeable. And Hebrews say that he is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. He says what he means, and he means what he says. No wonder why the psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 151 declares, You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as many would call it, in the Ten Commandments, God forbids us to tell lies. Commandment number nine, Exodus 20, 16 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This commandment, brothers and sisters, is divinely designed to protect our own and our neighbor's good name and character. Violation of the ninth commandment can destroy the witness moral standing. It can do injustice to our neighbor. It can prevent the course of justice and rob the slanderer of his or her capital. Christian B. Miller, writing in Scientific America, refers to the ninth commandment as the neglected virtue. The positive reading of the ninth commandment is, you shall always tell the truth. Amen. Amen. According to Miller, human codes easily recognize theft and murder and seek to repress them by severe punishment. However, they are quick to punish, they are not quick rather, to punish infractions committed by the tongue. In fact, many of the participants in a case study online hardly see anything wrong with telling lies. But I want to declare today that God does. God see lying as Lying as it is, he see it as sin, and he see it as wrong. Of the seven deadly sins God hates, lying is mentioned twice in the list, albeit from a different concept. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 17 and through 19, it says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, a heart that divides, uh, let, let me do verse 17, haughty eyes, what's the next one? A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that divides wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, uh, verse 90 says, a false witness who what? Breeds out lies. Twice it is mentioned in the list line. And one who sows this card among brothers. God hates a lying tongue. A false witness who breeds out lies. Stephen Zador in an article published in Cross River Therapy on August 24, uh, 2023, entitled Line Statistic and Facts. How often do people lie? Now, I I'm going to get myself in some trouble now. But this is not my study. If I know where uh, Stephen is, I would tell you so that you can stone him and beat him up for telling this. But he states that the average person lies two to three times a day, which amounts to at least 730 times for the year. So here are some key statistics um, that will appear up there. On an average, person lies two to three times a day. 
I, I hear a crew member say, no, pastor, not me. That was just a lie, crew member. 60% of people lie at least once in a 10-minute conversation. Now, now, number three. Brothers, I'm on your side. Please don't, please don't hold it against me. This is not my study. Men lie six times a day on average, while women lie three times a day on average. Brothers. Number four says 40% of people lie on their resume. 90% of people lie on their online dating profiles. 80% of women admit to lying to their partners about their spending habits. Come on, brothers. 50% of teenagers admit to lying to their parents about their whereabouts. People, number, number, number eight says, people are more likely to lie over the phone than face to face. 81% of people lie about their height, their weight, or their age online. And I believe all of us will now jump on this bandwagon. Uh, yeah. uh, politicians lie on an average once every five minutes during a debate. Time magazine once identified lying as an epidemic plague in the United States national character. The writer claimed everyone does. And viewing lie as the norm rather than the exception. However, brothers and sisters, lying is not just an American phenomenon. It is a worldwide plague. So here are some reasons why persons lie. Fear of punishment, 27% person, uh, persons who lie. Uh, fear of punishment, 23% uh, to protect themselves or others from harm, to avoid embarrassment or shame, to gain power or advantage over others, Mm. And the nine percent of persons who lie, they lie out of habit or compulsion. Now, you know, you know, you have some habitual liars around. You know, they they can't, they can't, they can't. I'm trying not to. They still lie. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but you know, um, I think it was Liar Liar. Uh, God despised brothers, brothers and sisters all sin. All sin. But the constant practice of lying among his people can be viewed as an attempt to deceive and to defraud God. Here's an example in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I just read a few verses. You'll find this story very interesting. It says in Acts chapter 1, uh, Acts chapter 5, or the verse. Uh, Starting at verse 1, it says, A man named Ananias, with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to thee? I want you to see that to the Holy Spirit. This is telling us that the Holy Spirit is not an influence, it's not an abstract thing that is a person because it says you lie to the Holy Spirit. And to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, no, no Peter questioning him. While it remained unsold, did, not, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not your at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have lied not to man, but to, but to God. 
And the next verse says, when, I, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Why did he die suddenly? Because he lied. And the rest of the story tells us that his wife came in afterwards, didn't know what happened, and when she was asked the question, she said, yes, that's what we got for selling the land. All that we got, we gave it to you. And Peter says, behold the feet of those who carry out your husband's body. And she uh, fell, dropped dead. I mean, fell and died. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, that we all have an inborn tendency to lie. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44, he described the evil one as a liar, the devil, and the father of lies. This crafty liar was at work in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 1, Genesis 3, rather, verses 1 through 5 capture much of this. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did not God actually, did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God says you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of life that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. This is in chapter 2, verse 17. Now watch verse 4. The, uh, in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely. Just to believe that lie cause a contagion of lying which has infected the human race ever since. Adam and Eve's immediate response was to hide from God and to deceive God pretending that they are not our own. So somebody asks the question, Pastor, why is it so easy to lie? That's a very good question. Our central problem is separation from God. The Bible says in Psalm 58, verse 3, even from birth, the wicked go astray, and from the womb, they are wayward and speak. So, the next question really is, how can a person be consistent with the truth? You know, the, the, the question came several different ways, and I have to confess, Pastor John, that I had to reword this question many times. So, this was the best way I can find. How can a person be consistent with the truth? The Ninth Commandment, brothers and sisters, insists that truthfulness should be sacred in every area of life. Jesus said that our talk should be honest, straightforward, and simple. Matthew 5, 37, listen to what Jesus says. Simply let your yes be and your no be. Anything beyond that or anything beyond this comes from the what? evil one. The Apostle Paul, Peter rather, he writes in 1 Peter 3.10, he says, whoever would love life and see God good days must keep his tongue from and his lips from deceitful speech. Now watch what Jesus says. Uh, as I bring this message to a close, Jesus says in John 14 verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him 
and manifest myself in him. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God, God's ten commandments are good for us. Yes. Very good for us. They protect us from ourselves and also from others and also from hurting others. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It's for our own benefit yes. and for our neighbor's benefit. Amen. It is very easy, like many of the other commandments, to lie. But God can give us the strength to overcome. Yes. Amen. He says in Isaiah 59 verse 1 and verse 2 It's not that I can't hear when you pray. It's not that I can't help you. The challenge is that there's a separation between you and I because of your sin. He says, come, I want to remove that separation. And I want to allow there to be a connection. Because we can only stop lying by constantly living in God's presence. Amen. The psalmist says, in his presence, there is what? Fullness of joy. And today, God is inviting us into his presence so that we can live victoriously, so that we can live meaningful and truthful life. If we despise the truth, we despise God. Today, God wants us to love the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He says, no one come unto the Father will I in any wise cast away. And so the invitation is to all of us today, not just for the ninth commandment, but all of God's commandment. Because James says that if we keep the whole law and yet offend in one, we are guilty of all. I want to, by God's grace and his power and his spirit living inside of me, to keep God's commandment. And I want you all to be on board. Are you on board today? Yes. Do you want to say, with, do you want Jesus to help us to keep his commandments? Yes. Well, if that is your desire, won't you join me in a word of prayer at this moment? Father, thank you so much for your word and for your people. We want to obey you. On our own, we can't do it, Lord. Because of the sinful nature we have been we were birthed with. But today, the born again experience is ours to experience. It's ours to have. Father, we want to have you as our God and no one else or nothing else. We want to worship you and not things, not our position nor our possession. You we want to worship. We want to live a life that reflect our calling and our surrender to Jesus. So we don't want to bear your name in vain, Father. Please help us. God, you have set aside the Sabbath from creation as your day of rest. We want to keep it according to your will. Please help us. We want to honor our parents. We want to respect them, Father. In some cases, God, it's difficult because of past experience, our present experience with them. But just as though you are loving them, we want to love them just the same way. Help us, Father. Please, Father, we ask that you will help us to be, to be honest in our dealing with each other. Help us, Lord, not to slander or assassin anyone with our tongue. 
because killing is more than just a physical taking of one's life. Sometimes we can kill person's character. Please, Father, help us not to do those things. And Father, help us, Father, not to steal from each other. Neither should we steal from you. Help us, Holy Father, to have good relationship. That those of us who are married, that we are faithful to our spouse. And where there are challenges, God, give us the strength, the knowledge, the vision, the help to work things through. And Holy Father, help us, Lord, not to lie, not to bear false witness, and not to covet others for what they have. Neither should we covet you, God. We bear your word that says, no good thing will you withhold from them that walk uprightly. And so, Lord, we know that all good gifts come from you, and you desire your children to be the head and not the tail. May we strive, Lord, for excellence and even for the best out of life and in life. But we strive, through, we strive, God, through your will and by your Spirit's guidance. And finally, Lord, when time shall be no more in this earth and the role is called up yonder, may by our full surrender to you we be in that number. And live with you throughout the countless ages of eternity is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we extend our prayer with the singing of a hymn, and since our pianist is here, we can do this. Uh, we're going to do the first and last stanza of the song, Whiter Than Snow. That's the first and last stanza uh, to bring this message to a close. Lucifer, disguised as the serpent, told Eve that she could eat of that fruit that you had commanded us not to eat of, and that if she did, she wouldn't die, but she would become wise like a god, understanding good and evil. And Lord, he's telling that same lie today. He's telling us that if we 
follow our own desires instead of following your commands that, that, that we, we will be the ones that get to discern what's good and what's bad and that, and that everybody gets to decide their own morality. What's good for one may not be good for another. Lord, we understand that is a lie. We understand that we were created to live in complete harmony, living according to your will, serving you and worshiping you. We understand that the only joy that can come, the only true joy, is through that surrender and living as we were designed to live. Lord, help us not to just not tell lies, but to stop believing lies. Help us to stand on your word. Help us to surrender completely to you and live according to your will, live according to our purpose, which is to worship you and to praise you and to love you because you loved us before we were even born. Lord, we pray that your spirit will follow out us out of here today and through the week that you will remind us to surrender and surrender, and surrender again. You are our only hope. And for that, we thank you, and we praise you, and we love you. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen.